Hi, this is Randall Schwartz, host of Floss Weekly. This week, Gareth Greenaway joins me. We're going to be talking about Creu. It's a way of stopping your containers and starting them up somewhere else, maybe. You're not going to want to miss this, so stay tuned. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Floss Weekly is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E. FLY dot com. This is Floss Weekly with Randall Schwartz and Gareth Greenaway. Episode 334, recorded April 29th, 2015. Creu. It's time for Floss Weekly, the show about free, libre, open source software. I am your host, Randall Schwartz, Merlin at Stonehenge.com, bringing you each week. The movers, the shakers, the big projects, little projects, projects you may be using every day and not being aware of it, projects that you really should be aware of and aren't yet, but thanks to this show, you do get to find out about those. Uh, Joining me today will be Gareth Greenaway. Gareth, welcome back to the show. Thanks, Randall. Thanks for having me back. Glad to be here. And and where are you speaking to us from? I am deep within my underground bunker in Thousand Oaks, California. (laughs) Preparing for next year's scale already? Preparing for next year's scale, yes. Do you have an actual job, too, or are you just scale guy? I, I, I do have an actual job, yes. <laughs> Good. I'm glad. You're gainfully employed. That's the important part. Me, too. In fact, I am at, as people recognize if they're watching the video, I'm once again at ZipRecruiter's headquarters in downtown Santa Monica, California. I've been a client. No, they've been a client of mine for almost a year and a half. So I've been enjoying them. They've been paying the bills very well. So, uh, but of course, the show is not about us or locations. The show is about our guests. This week, I have two people on whose names I cannot pronounce very well, but I'll give it a try. Uh, we're going to talk about the Creu Project, and we've brought on Kirill... Kolish, Kolishkin and Pavel Emelyanov, something like that. I believe they're Russian, both of them. So uh, um, they're going to talk about Creu, which is the. Uh, ooh, 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 I've got to put my slide up here. Where is my slide? Creu is uh, the a uh, uh, software tool for the Linux operating system, and using this tool, it's possible to freeze a running application and checkpoint it to persistent storage as a collection of files. Sounds pretty fun. What do you know about this so far, Gareth? Except other than what I just read. <laughs> Other than what you just read, not not too much. Um, I, I skimmed it a bit this morning, and it, it sounds very interesting. I, from what I could tell, it's, um, yeah, exactly what you said, being able to to freeze an application in its current state and then pick up where you left off with it. Well, and, and, and I also understand there are app, there are things that do this already. I mean, I know that VirtualBox can, for example, do a live migration of an entire operating system over to another place. But I think what distinguishes this particular feature, this particular project, is that they're doing this in user space mostly. So they do they can do containers, so a just small part of what an actual uh, operating system would be. So I'm interested in hearing more about this. But instead of us chatting about this back and forth, uh, oh, I was I was going to go. Well, we have somebody to talk to yet, but we don't. We don't. It's we're going to go right into the show. So let's go ahead and bring on Kirill. Kirill, welcome to the show. Uh, hi there. Uh, really glad to be here. And uh, I'm here from uh, Kirkland, Washington, my home office. Oh, cool, cool. So we're all in the same time zone, which is sort of fun. That's great. Yep. And uh, go ahead and pronounce your name so at least it's once said correctly in this show. Uh, in English, I usually say Kirill Kolishkin, and in Russian, it would be Kirill Kolishkin. So Very cool. Very cool. Let's go ahead also and bring on Pavel. Pavel, welcome to the show. Hello, guys. <clears throat> nice to be Hi. here with you. Yes, and, and where are you speaking to us from? Uh, I'm currently in Moscow, Russia, uh, in, my, in parallel surface. Oh wow! So it's what? What time is it there? It must be like ten o'clock or something. I uh, it's almost seven p.m. Okay, so my math is horrible today. Well, that makes sense. Okay, so uh, let's go ahead and start with uh, um, 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 uh, Kirill. Um, why don't you tell us? Give us the thirty thousand foot view. What is what is uh, Q uh, 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 Kriu, uh so- What problem is it solving? And and how did it get started? Uh, so basically, we are working on containers for the last 15 years since 1999 that I actually discovered just recently. And uh, uh, 
one of the features that we had in our containers implementation was an ability to live migrate those containers back and forth between uh, different physical servers and also the ability to checkpoint and restore the containers. So we do have our own in-kernel implementation of checkpoint restore for containers as being groups of processes. Uh, and we had a hard time trying to uh, merge this functionality into the upstream kernel. Uh, with the problem being with the in-kernel checkpointing is touches pretty much every subsystem in the kernel, except maybe for drivers. So no no kernel maintainer wanted to see that extra code in, in the tree, in, in the code. Uh, so we ended up, uh, you know, completely failing to merge this stuff upstream. Uh, and then Pavel figured out if we can't do it in the kernel, if we can't merge it into the upstream kernel, let's just do it in user space instead. So that's sort of a bit of a hack around the inability to merge this stuff into the upstream. And then he got that idea initially. I was like, are you crazy or what? It's not going to work at all. And uh, I'm, I was pretty sp skeptical about that. I I... I can say that I was wrong at this time. Uh, hmm. But then the other guys like Andrew Morton and Linus Torvalds, the upstream kernel maintainers, saw that idea. They were pretty skeptical as well. But in the end, uh, when I look at it now, we we have succeeded. It, it's working. Very cool. And actually, just to have uh, Linus's feedback to that, I, I'm reading this from the Wikipedia page again. Uh, a note on this. This is a project by various mad Russians to perform CR, mainly from user space, with the various oddball helper code added to the kernel where the need is demonstrated. So so that would that, you two would be the, the, the mad Russians? Uh, well, the, the, it's not just two. We, our team is about uh, up to 10 people, I, I guess. Cool, cool. And Pavel, how did this idea occur to you to do some of the work in user space? Uh, well, to begin with, uh, Kirill said that we tried to push the in-kernel implementation, uh, which didn't succeed, uh, didn't succeed at the end. And uh, while implementing the in-kernel solution, uh, some pieces of the restore part uh, were still done in the user space. So wh while thinking on that, I decided that we can do more in the user space. Uh, the uh, justification was quite simple. If, uh, if the processes has managed to enter the state we see them in, uh, then there is enough kernel API to turn them into that state. So we can just reuse one to restore the processes. Uh, so the second half of the project uh, appeared to be like <clears throat> doable in the user space uh, completely. Uh, doing the dump from the user space or the checkpoint part, uh, it was actually suggested by several people on the kernel mailing list. They, well, they didn't actually suggest to do it. They, they asked, why couldn't we do it from the user space? I isn't there enough kernel API to read the state we need? Uh, in, on most of the answer, on most of the questions, the answers were no. Uh, kernel API, uh, especially the one that reads the state, uh, was, was quite small, and uh, it was not enough for for checkpoint. Uh, so, as a proof of concept, I decided to uh, really try uh, this API and try to read the. Uh, information about quite a simple process. It was just a binary without libraries with a single pipe opened and a file on disk. Mm -hmm. So it quickly turned out that yes, kernel API was not sufficient. Uh, and this, uh, this tiny problem uh, has finally happened to be the major one we've been solving in the kernel. So every time we want to checkpoint something new, uh, for example, state of asynchronous I.O. or some information about sockets uh, and things like that. Uh, we always see that kernel provides very flexible and rich API for configuring the things. Uh, 
Mm -hmm. uh, but very, very tiny API for reading what was configured back. Mm. Uh, so it, it's quite natural. If an application requested something from the kernel, it probably knows uh, what, what it has done. Uh, but uh, it's not the case for a checkpoint because uh, we do not know what application has requested. We have no idea what uh, what variables or data structure sits in its memory. So we have to ask the kernel, and kernel uh, kernel doesn't expect us to ask these things. So we started patching the kernel API part to uh, to give us more information about uh, processes. Uh, so far, we, we have, um, I do not know, remember the exact number, but about a hundred of patches into different kernel subsystems. They are all upstream already. And they mostly uh, extend the kernel API uh, in, it, in the parts that uh, get the data from the kernel back. So, For example, so, yeah. yeah. So, uh, so I'm... I Let's let's go like like one step higher. I mean, we're talking about some really interesting detailed stuff, and I enjoy this. But so, why would you want to checkpoint or migrate a container or processes within a container? Why why would you even want to do that? Uh, okay, so uh, initially we uh, wanted to only to live migrate containers. Uh, we've seen uh, uh, two use cases for that. First okay. is first is to upgrade hardware nodes, uh, the kernels on the hardware nodes. So when you have, uh, I don't know, tens or hundreds of containers on your node and you want to update a kernel or system libraries, uh, you typically need to stop all the containers, then boot into the new kernel, then start them back. Uh, it's quite annoying uh, because of the downtime. Uh, and since containers are really small and dense, uh, you typically have uh, hundreds of them. And uh, stopping hundreds of containers and starting them back takes time. Mm -hmm. So if you have a spare node, you can live migrate containers on it, then update the kernel on the original one, then uh, live migrate them back. That was the first use case. Uh, another usage for live migration was in plans, but we... Uh, I actually wanted to implement it quite fast. It's it's about load balancing. If you have a cluster of nodes, uh, each of them hosting containers, uh, some of containers uh, may suffer from big load from the from the outside. Uh, some of them may be idle, and it would be nice to move these containers around to uh, make uh, the load on the nodes more or less equal. And it would be nice to do it without actually stopping the containers. So you want to take containers and move it to another hardware node so that container client or whoever works with it doesn't notice this has happened. Uh, th this is for live migration. This is why we wanted live migration for. Uh, a little bit later, we saw another uh, possibility for the checkpoint restore uh, <coughs> technology itself. Uh, it also was about upgrading the nodes. Uh, the thing is that updating a node uh, using live migration requires one more available, available node in the data center. So you can live migrate containers somewhere. Uh, if it's not the case, uh, if you don't have a free hardware, or it's busy or just not available, uh, you still have to stop the containers, uh, update the kernel, and boot everything back. Uh, using Checkpoint Restore, it can be uh, speeded up significantly. Uh, the, the idea is quite simple. If you can save the state of your container and keep it in RAM, uh, and uh, then replace the kernel without uh, doing the cold reboot, it's nowadays possible with KXEC technology. It just uh, jumps into a new kernel. And then if you restore containers back, then it seems for container client that not just uh, got frozen for a while, for several seconds maybe. Uh, we call this seamless kernel update. Uh, so uh, 
right now we do it in parallel products like this. We freeze containers in RAM, save their state, then re replace the kernel, then recreate them back from the state files. Uh, these were our uh, use cases we wanted to have. Uh, when we started Cruyo and opened it, we uh, received suggestions from people what else can be done using Cruyo. We collect them on the wiki page, on the Cruyo.org site. Uh, one of the first uh, suggestions we saw was from people uh, playing with high-performance computing. Uh, they want to uh, save the state of their tasks doing complex math calculations somewhere in between. So in case of power failure in the data center, they do not have to recalculate everything from the scratch. Uh, so they really want to take uh, snapshots of their applications once uh, an hour or once every 30 minutes or something like that. Uh, with Creo, it's also possible. Creo supports incremental uh, state snapshots. Uh, it was actually one of the first uh, contributors to the project. It was a guy from Germany. He played with HPC in his labs and started using Creo when it was uh, in, in even in pre-alpha stage. But it was acceptable for him because HPC tasks are typically quite... Uh, they, they are not complex. They typically have just a big amount of RAM, a couple of open files, and that's it. So no complex tricks should be done with checkpoints or restore. It worked for him pretty well. So how does this work from like, so I, I'm ready to use Creo and, and I want to kind of migrate either an application or I want to I want to checkpoint and restore an application or a container and migrate it from one server to another. How do I, how do I go about doing that? What are the, what are the steps? What are the, the kind of caveats or, or problems that I might encounter? Oh, that's a good question. So, uh, <clears throat> uh, first of all, uh, uh, if you want to live migrate a container, uh, uh, how, how do pe people think of live migration? Is when you save the state, copy it on the other host, then restore from the state. Uh, the thing is that uh, this uh, straightforward approach uh, leads to big frozen times because the amount of memory uh, applications may use uh, can be quite big. And if you do not have uh, extremely fast network links, uh, time to transfer all the states from one node to another can take an uh, arbitrary amount of time, minutes, tens of minutes and more. Uh, this freeze time is unacceptable. So to do good life migration, uh, one should uh, play tricks with uh, iterations. So we have to first move to first move the memory. Uh, without freezing the processes, so they still uh, they are still working. Then they have to capture what which parts of memory has changed and transfer them. Uh, then repeat this process again until we decide that the amount of data we will need to transfer on the next iteration is small enough. Uh, then freeze processes, take full snapshots, copy it on uh, on the destination node and restore. Uh, optionally, uh, people uh, might want to use uh, post-copy life migration. It's when you copy all the state of the container except the memory and then uh, use the source node as a sort of networking swap device to pull all the memory in on demand and in the background. Uh, the second thing to, uh, to worry about is uh, is the file system. Uh, if you have a shared file system between uh, source and destination nodes, it's okay, you just uh, dump and restore. Uh, if you have to copy files, you should uh, do similar things with iterations because uh, the amount of files to copy is typically much, much bigger than the amount of memory. Uh, uh, of course, uh, the third thing is uh, taking care of uh, Whereas failures during this process, because if at any stage you fail to do the next step, you have to carefully roll things back 
and restart container on the original node without breaking the connectivity. Uh, the fourth thing would be to check whether CPUs are compatible uh, on the source and destination node so that the instructions that are used by a software uh, will still work on the destination node. Uh, the same is about all the system resources that can be used. For example, we've seen with OpenVZ that people do not use IPv6 on all the nodes and live migrating IPv6 container on the node without this support is, of course, impossible. So uh, if you do all this stuff, uh, you have live migrated your container. Uh, but the thing is that I have... Uh, uh, I have described quite a lot of steps uh, and things to be done. So to automate this task, uh, we have started a, a sub-project of Creo. It's called Pihole. Uh, it's, uh, right now, it's a Python script which automates all the steps I have described. It uh, checks the need to copy file systems. It uh, does iterations. It copies memory. In advance, it checks for duplicates, it checks for the changes, it keeps uh, track of failures and rolls things back, it checks for CPU's compatibilities. Uh, and uh, we plan to push this project forward uh, with uh, integrating it with, uh, with OpenVZ. Uh, right now, it's, it's not yet integrated. Uh, we also have uh, uh, people from uh, Alexi team and Docker team who are also interested in live migration, so they will uh, likely join the party and help us uh, develop the live migration script further. Uh, so that's a good segue. Um, Kirill, can you tell us a bit about what the OpenVZ project is and how it relates to uh, Creo? Oh, okay. Uh, so, as I said earlier, we're doing containers since last century and uh, and at this time, uh, we have our own kernel, which implements various containers related things like uh, namespaces and resource management. Um, and uh, actually, it also implements that checkpoint restore, but in a different way than Creo. And um, one of the goals of the project is to merge bits and pieces of our container technology upstream. And this is what we sort of succeeded uh, by two-thirds, I said. So, uh, I mean, most of the functionality is already there in the upstream kernel. And it's being used by projects such as Docker, LXC, CoreOS, and now even Systemd. Um, but, um, but we still have some bits and pieces remaining in our kernel that are not yet ported to upstream, that are not yet merged to upstream. Um, so this is what we do as as part of working on OpenVZ. But in general, it's just a set of uh, user space tools plus our kernel in order to run containers. Uh, those containers are quite similar to LXC containers, just uh, we feel they, they're a bit better in that regard, uh, in mostly in terms of resource management, I guess, and in terms of maturity. So, and, uh, and basically Creo project uh, was born when we tried to merge the live migration functionality and we failed. And uh, next version of OpenVC, which is currently in alpha ver alpha quality. Uh, it will use Creo as means of checkpoint and restore. So you say that um, like OpenVZ has been around um, since I think you, you know, if I'm if I heard that right, 1999, um, providing it's actually, it's, uh, it's it's actually OpenVZ as a separate project. It's been around since 2006. But internally, we're working on containers since about 1999, and we had the first working mock-up version in 2000. Okay. 
Um, so I, I was curious what you think about the new kind of like everyone's the, the last year or so, uh, two years, everyone has gone kind of like container crazy. Um, containers are the, the next new thing, the next like shiny thing that everyone's excited about. And you guys have kind of had and been thinking about container technology for quite a while. What what you think of the 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 kind of everyone going crazy for them the last few years? I I mean I'm really happy that people finally started to realize that the containers are pretty powerful tool and uh, and they can be used also for containerizing applications the way that Docker does. So uh, the difference between OpenVZ and Docker would be that OpenVZ containerized the whole system, the whole Linux distribution, while Docker containerizes an application, just a single application, which is something that we should have done but haven't done. Um, but now uh, we're trying to work with Docker in, on different levels um, and um, ensure an interoperability. For example, now you can run Docker containers inside OpenVC containers. It's sort of the Russian doll style uh, container within a container and it's working. And uh, we are also, we also have another project that makes use of OpenVC kernel uh, as opposed to the upstream kernel in order to run Docker containers. So we use OpenVC kernel to create Docker containers, uh, which is done by a library called libct, which we wrote. Um, and that library is talking to the Docker library, which is called libcontainer. Uh, and, and the other thing is we do with Docker is, of course, Crew, because uh, now with Crew we can live migrate Docker containers. So, um, of course, it's not all about Docker. Uh, there are also other interesting projects like CoreOS and SystemD is now trying to use namespaces and Google have their own containers projects. I mean, this is definitely not something new. For all I know, Google is using containers in their own infrastructure for, for about five years already. And uh, LXC is not new either. But, but now, yeah, it's just that it finally reached the prime time, I should say. So, I mean, containers are not direct replacement for VMs. They both have their pros and cons, but the good thing about containers is they coexist with VMs. It's sort of the orthogonal technology. They can be nested or they can just coexist uh, so, for example, with OpenVZ, you can create containers and on the same time, at the same physical server, you can also create virtual machines. And uh, they, they don't affect the performance of each other. And, I mean, in the end, more choices are good for end user, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Um, so, Parvel... Uh, hopefully I pronounced that right. Um, so one of the questions that I was thinking about while you were kind of describing the whole process of Creo was if, if a lot of times like you have a, a laptop, a Linux laptop, and you're, you're done for the day, you don't want to necessarily shut it down, you, you will suspend it. And, and that's been an available and possible for um, quite a while. And, and it works m mostly depending on what laptop you have. How does Creo come into that? That, that space? How does it, how will it affect um, people's ability to suspend or, or uh, and suspend and resume um, their laptops running Linux? Oh, okay. Uh, well, it's an interesting usage uh, for crew indeed, yeah. Uh, the thing about suspending and resuming a laptop is that uh, uh, right now crew is not ready to do this trick. Uh, that's because uh, since we've started with containers uh, and containers uh, do not mess with the hardware at all, uh, we didn't consider scenarios when any application 
uses something on the hardware level. For example, opens uh, some file from CSFS, which is very uh, sensitive to how hardware behaves or maps uh, into its virtual memory some uh, uh, regions which refer to hardware and things like that. Uh, but uh, when it comes to laptop, uh, there are applications that are hardware dependent, for example, uh, the graphical subsystem. It uh, depends on the uh, video card you use heavily. And if you want to take, uh, take a snapshot of this application, you should definitely take care about the hardware itself. Uh, uh, so, as I told right now, Crew cannot do it. Uh, but uh, even if someday it will be able to do uh, such things, uh, it will be, from my perspective, still much more reliable to do it the way it's done right now. Uh, that's because uh, in order to take a snapshot, Crew gets quite a lot of uh, information from the kernel. It can be very complicated. Crew does its best to find all the uh, cross-references between objects uh, it, it reads information about. Uh, upon restore, we have to put all these cross-references back and it's also quite a complex thing. Uh, unlike that, uh, current implementation of laptop suspend resume just uh, takes care about uh, memory contents. Uh, regardless of what's in there, what kind of objects are in there. So for a simple case, when you just want to close your laptop and open it back, uh, exim existing, existing implementation of it will, will not be replaced with Creo, uh, unless I do not believe in it. But uh, if you want to uh, put your laptop to sleep and then wake it up on the newer kernel, in this case, uh, Creo would be the only option uh, because with new kernel uh, one cannot keep one cannot keep all objects all kernel objects in memory because they uh, will change and Creo will be able to read uh, the kernel independent uh, versions of these uh, objects and restore them back. Wow, that so seems for, all... Sorry, yeah. go ahead. No, no, just wanted to repeat that for a simple uh, close the lead, open the lead, uh, Crew is no use. It's too complex and uh, it, it will uh, literally take much more time than just uh, uh, doing the existing suspend restore. Uh, yeah, I was going to say most laptops have the right hardware and, and a little bit of software assist to, you know, basically say stop what you're doing because you're going to sleep right now. And that's that's pretty yeah. good. So that's already well-known well technology. And I, now, I, I, I've been thinking for the last 10, 15 minutes listening to you guys talk. I, so, so we've got a process and it's got, you know, obviously the state of the memory, state of the registers, that sort of thing. I understand how you restore that state, but then it also has open files, and even more strangely, like open network connections. How in the world do you identify all those and bring them back to life after, uh, you know, just suspend and resume, but more importantly, like migration? How do, how do you get TCP connections to go to the right place? Uh, okay, so uh, with TCP connection, uh, it was... Uh a very challenging task when we did that. Hey, Pavel, uh, maybe you should start with the simple things first, like how <laughs> do you checkpoint and restore open files, so that's easy to explain, uh, and uh, so on. Okay. Yeah. Uh, with open files, it's it's really very easy. So, uh, it, it's all about the API. When an application opens a file, uh, it knows uh, one new thing it knows that there is some object inside the kernel which can be referenced uh, using a number it uh, got from the open system call. Yes. Which can... File descriptor. Uh, yeah, file descriptor. Which can, yep. like, produce data uh, with the read system call and where one can put data using the write system call. Uh, and the good thing is that... Uh, for every single process, we can know exactly which file descriptors uh, were opened and which kind of file sits behind them. We can find it out by uh, scanning the proc directory. So, 
With just open files, things are really, really very simple. We go to proc, read these file descriptors, check the file types. If we see that it's a file on disk, uh, we just save the file path into image. Uh, on restore, we open the file back using the plain open system call, uh, then put this file into a proper descriptor using DAP2 system call. It allows to specify which file descriptor you want to see this file uh, with. So with open file, uh, we just uh, recreate this, this single thing application knows about the kernel. Uh, and then there is also a position inside the open file, so we have to uh, still seek it. Yes, position and flags, uh, th these are details. But, but as a basic thing, it's just a file descriptor and the path, and that's it. This, uh, all this information can be seen from the kernel. Uh, of course, from the kernel pers perspective, uh, the exact object will disappear after dump, and will, and new object will appear after restore. But that's uh, the kernel internal knowledge application has no idea about that, and uh, this is why we can do checkpoint and restore. With TCP connection, uh, things are a little bit more complex. So first of all, TCP connection is a socket. Uh, which is again seen by an application uh, with a file descriptor. So first thing we do is we uh, get this number and put it into the image. Uh, then we find out that the file behind the file descriptor is a TCP socket. Uh, we can do it uh, very easily by uh, first asking the kernel for what kind of file is it. It will tell that it's a socket. Then we can call network subsystem asking for what protocol family and exact protocol is there. Kernel would tell us that it is, for example, protocol family INET and exact protocol is uh, IP proto TCP. After getting all the information, we have to, yes, do something with the, with the TCP connection itself. And uh, the fact we actively use while checkpointing and restoring uh, the TCP connection is that TCP protocol uh, allows and actually survives if one end of this connection uh, temporarily stops responding. Like an application sends the data to a server and this data can be lost anywhere in between. Uh, TCP protocol stands that pretty well. It will uh, detect that, will try to resend data, and uh, if the if this uh, connection loss time is small enough, it will just survive. Just a small delay in, in communication would occur. So what we do with TCP is first we uh, we lock this connection with net filter or with any other means that we have. For example, with containers, we detach the virtual NIC from, from bridge or from routing. So from uh, after that, the peer of the application starts thinking that there is some temporary connection loss, like, I don't know, uh, root has changed and packet starts dropping, or cord has been damaged and things like that. So the peer sits and thinks that packets just do not reach the destination and do not appear from it. After that, we go to the kernel and get uh, all the information about the TCP connection we need. Uh, basically, the information about TCP connection is quite limited. It's, uh, it's a pair of IP addresses, source and destination. It's a pair of ports. We can get it using standard API. Uh, more things are TCP specific. For example, we need to get sequence number TCP uses to properly order arriving packets, packets one after another. So we have to get the sequences. Then we have to get the data which sits in TCP queues. That's the second thing. And the third thing, uh, the third thing is, is uh, very protocol specific. These are options that TCP has negotiated uh, during the three-way handshake. It's the window scale factor, timestamps bit, and things like that. So to get all the TCP-specific information, we worked with the uh, networking community uh, and with the networking kernel maintainer. And we developed a 
mode for TCP sockets, which we call repair mode. Uh, when turning socket uh, into this mode, I mean the TCP socket, it only applies to TCP sockets. When we turn TCP sockets into the repair mode, it starts working uh, in, a, in a way that you ask something from the socket, for example, to establish a connection or to set up a local address or to send data. And TCP sockets does exactly what's been asked, but without communicating to the other end on the network. For example, we ask it, try to connect to 1.3.4 port 66. Uh, kernel immediately responds, okay, connected, but it doesn't send any packets to the network. Yes. Uh, so with the repair mode, after we have locked the connection, we get all the bits uh, from the kernel, then move the socket on another node, uh, all the images on another node, then create TCP socket again, put it into repair state, and then put all the bits uh, back into the socket. We connect it uh, in the repair mode to the original destination, we put sequences back, we put all the data in queues, and then we'll unlock the connection. Uh, so from both sides, nothing has changed. The socket, the socket on the remote side hasn't changed because we, we haven't touched it. The socket on the local side uh, hasn't changed because we have restored all the connection uh, bits we wanted. We restored both addresses, we restored both ports, we put all the sequences and data back into the queues. Uh, so the connection just goes on. Uh, with minor gap, uh, with minor uh, delay, because while we did all this stuff, uh, TCP might have seen some delay in packets delivery and might have thought that uh, something bad has happened and I have to slow down and start resending packets uh, slowly in a, in a second or two. So for this period, we'll see the delay, but after that, TCP will restore original flow back and uh, will continue uh, uh, sending and uh, receiving packets as it used to. So if I can summarize, uh, it's hard, but you made it work. Uh, it's hard, <laughs> yes, but it seemed, seemed to work. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the one thing I'm curious about, though, is you're not actually, you're not actually going to be able to migrate to a machine with a different IP address with that strategy, right? Yes, of course, but uh, it's natural limitation. The remote peer would see packets coming from from alien IP and will just reset its connection. It's just how TCP works. Oh, that's awesome! Very cool. Actually, we have a question from the uh, chat room. Uh, does some type of apps? Are they impossible to checkpoint and restore? I mean, what, what are your limitations on this so far? Uh, well, f first limitation we have is applications that uh, open or map some device, some hardware. Uh, in Linux, it's quite easy to detect if we have opened or mapped a character, a block device of... Uh, with a major and minor pair we do not know, we know that it's a hardware and we not, do not dump and restore it. Uh, plus we have several more limitations with types of sockets we support, but it's not because we cannot do it at all, simply because we haven't met this socket in reality. For example, I don't know, uh, if a ping application opens an ICMP socket, we see that it's ICMP and refuse to dump just because we didn't implement this. Uh, some weird protocols, I don't know, like uh, IPX and, uh, and things like that. Uh, some time ago, we couldn't uh, checkpoint and restore applications doing asynchronous I.O., but with a uh, fresh enough kernel we have managed to do it. Uh, what else do we have right now? Uh, right now, I, I cannot recall any more widely used uh, things in the kernel applications may use and we would refuse them to check. Point. We actually keep track of all this stuff on crew.org uh, site. There is a page called what cannot be checkpointed. But we are trying to reduce the amount of items in it. So one of the things I was thinking about when you were you were given the really long, very detailed, very awesome answer um, 
migrating TCP connections, um, was how, how the speed of, of like a typical migration and how much, like if someone was to, to take a, a container or an application and checkpoint and restore it to a different uh, system, what's the typical migration time that that would take and how much downtime would they expect to see? Oh, uh, let okay. me take this one. Uh, sure. uh, the thing is, uh, what you're looking for is uh, uh, you can look for the like the total migration time from the time you started it and uh, from the time that, that it's uh, working on the other server. Uh, this is not what we're trying to optimize for. What we're trying to optimize for is the time between the processes are frozen and then uh, they are unfrozen on the destination system. So this is what we optimize for. Um, and because of that, so to make the frozen time as short as possible. Uh, and in order to do that, uh, as Pavel said earlier, we... For example, we do tricks like we're trying to preheat the destination system memory with the source system memory. So we migrate the memory beforehand and we do it in an iterative fashion while the application is still running on the, on the source system. And uh, we also have to take care about file system if it's not a shared file system. And, and that... Uh, makes the total migration time bigger but it makes the frozen time smaller so um, depending on the nature of the application depending on the uh, disk space being used uh, it can take it can easily actually take hours but the frozen time it should be, I believe it should be under two minutes uh, for, I mean, in the worst case scenario, it should be under two minutes in order for all the network connections to be saved. Uh, but in, in general, a small application will migrate in second or sub-second time. And a big application will take, uh, a wall clock time will be up to a few hours but the frozen time is maybe within a few seconds. So if, if it's something like you're, you're planning on doing like just like an, as a, a regular task, is, is that something you can prepare ahead of time? Um, um, like if you know... Yeah, I, I, I mean, if you don't have a shared file system, you need to, you need to make sure that the file system is the same on both nodes. You can do that, for example, you can do some preliminary R-sync, for, for example, uh, of the source files to destination. And depending on how much data you have there, it, it can take quite a lot of time. And then you can use crew to uh, copy most of the memory from the task. If it's a huge task, like, I don't know, a huge database that takes gigabytes of RAM, it, it will take time to migrate those. But with Creo, we had that mechanism to figure out what memory pages were changed. It's called like it's it's like a memory tracker, uh, and uh, you can have a similar mechanism to figure out which files have been changed, or which or or which blocks of files have been changed. So, if you do. If you do that, if you precede the memory and precede the file system, then you can speed up, speed up the migration and make the frozen time as short as possible. So one of the things you mentioned was the the, the kind of preheat um, transfer. Is there a way to know ahead of time that that, that preheat method uh, requires you to resync things, or or is so that like what when you go to migrate that you know this is actually where the application or, or where things should be in a, in the correct state. So I I, I think that uh, you can actually implement uh, something like high availability thing with that. Uh, so basically, if you copy uh, and constantly copy all the memory to the destination system and constantly copy uh, 
the state of the application in in case to, to some other server in case this server crashes you can continue it on the other server uh, but but yeah basically uh, the we're talking about memory and we're talking about file system uh, or files uh, if we talk about memory uh, the way we <coughs> implement that is, is you just take all the memory and copy it to the destination system memory. And just before doing that, we protect all the pages. They sort of become read, they become read only. And if an application writes to a page, that the page fault occurs, and uh, the page is becoming read write, and then we mark the dirty bit that like this page is modified. And uh, for the next round, you don't have to go through all the memory. You just get those pages that are marked as dirty, and you migrate those. And you can do that in an iterative fashion. Uh, so you can do uh, a few rounds, or you actually can uh, try to do it like constantly to have the same memory on the both systems. And uh, of course, one final round that you need to have is then you freeze the applications, so no, my, my, the memory is not modified. And then you copy the remaining remaining pages that they modified. Uh, it this about the same technology can be applied to uh, syncing the file system. Uh, so, for example, in OpenVZ we have the block device called Ploop, uh, which uses the similar technology. Basically, if some blocks of data are modified, it it just marks them and it keeps tracks of those modified blocks. So first of all, you copy all the block device, all the blocks from the block device, and then you ask the that, that Pilup kernel subsystem like which blocks of data they're modified, and then you copy over those blocks. Uh, and, and so on until you decide that it's time to stop, then you freeze the application and do the last final round of, of memory and... Uh, of the block device. But th this is just one of the possibility. The other possibility that Pavel mentioned is you can you can do it vice versa. You can actually migrate like the minimum set that is enough to start the application on the destination and then use a system uh, memory the source system memory as a network swap device and you pull in all the remaining memory pages while your application has already migrated. So depending on what your setup is and what your scenario is, you can you can use uh, various forms of optimization to, to migrate it faster. Cool. Interesting. Um, so one of the final things I wanted to ask um, about both projects, both OpenVZ and um, Creo, um, what uh, license are they released under? It's new GPL version 2, although in OpenVZ we have some libraries licensed under library GPL, LGPL. Okay. But and, yeah, and what is uh, it, we use the same license, usually use the same license as the kernel, which is GPL version 2. Okay. Makes sense. Um, and who does who typically commits to, to both projects? Uh, Pavel. Yeah. Uh, I get that. Sorry? Uh, it's talking about contributions from other people. No, no, I, I thought you wanted to answer this. Okay. Uh, so for for OpenVZ, we have uh, uh, contributions from uh, uh, quite a lot of people, but uh, they they mostly come to the user space part of the project. Uh, uh, that's because in the kernel space, the rule upstream first is very, very strict. So if someone wants to get... Uh, uh, get a kernel feature in the OpenVZ, it's required to have this in the upstream kernel uh, first and then uh, backporting it into the OpenVZ kernel. Uh, so if we talk about a pure OpenVZ kernel that uh, only Parallels and OpenVZ guys commit to the kernel. Uh, 
with Creo. Uh, it's been quite standalone for a while from the rest of OpenVZ. Uh, with Creo, I have lots of contributions from Parallels, of course. Uh, and uh, since uh, uh, since uh, September 2014, uh, we had uh, Canonical guys joined us. Uh, they made uh, up to 20% of the code we have right now. Uh, I mean, the changed code. Uh, we also had uh, several guys from Google. Uh, they were interested in live migrating Docker containers, and they uh, also did lots of stuff for Creo. And uh, they are currently main guys who drive uh, Creo integration into Docker. Uh, we have... Uh, uh, just enthusiast contributions, uh, several people, and uh, a couple of one or two months ago, we even had people from Red Hat interested in Creo and uh, did quite a lot of uh, things in the code. Okay. Um, so, what what how does both the, the community for both um, projects look? Is it is it kind of um, a, a thriving community, or are you guys? Oh, I mean, obviously, you're you're probably looking for more people to to be a part of it. How if if someone's interested in being part of those two projects, what do, what where do they go, and what what can they um, where can they they find how to to join the the communities? I I believe it's about the same pro, uh, process. Basically, you go to the openvz.org or crew.org and look for pages that uh, describes how to contribute to the projects and uh, in both projects the main communication is done through the mailing list it's developed at crew.org uh, for openvz and crew at openvz.org for crew and this is where all the discussions are happening and um, in, in terms of where to get the source code, it's all on us, src.openvz.org. We have the Git repos for all of our projects in there. And uh, finally, we do have IRC channels on freenode.net. It's uh, OpenVZ and Crew channels, respectively. Awesome, awesome. I, yeah, a, oh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, I'm done. Okay. All right. I was going to say, this has been a fascinating show, uh, and I, we got really geeky there for a while, which I know half of my audience is probably going, ooh, give me more, give me more. And the other half is going, what the heck are they talking about? But uh, this, <laughs> I mean, this has been a wonderful show. Um, uh, we're almost out of time. Is there anything we haven't covered yet that you want to make sure we cover before we let you go? Either, either of you? I think it was good. <laughs> okay, well, that's great. Well, I have two final questions to ask each of you, which uh, if I don't ask, people yell at me and email tomorrow or the next day. So uh, we'll start first with um, first with uh, Kirill. Uh, what's your favorite text editor? I use VI. Oh, okay, Vim, all right. Vim, actually. Yeah, Vim, okay, right. You know, if Vim had been available when I was first learning text editors, I might not have ever touched Emacs, but sorry, guys, I'm an Emacs guy. So, And what's your uh, favorite scripting language? I, I usually use Bash, and sometimes I use Python, but I think that Bash is my favorite. Sure, sounds good. Okay, and off to uh, Pavel. Uh, same two questions. Uh, I use VI too. <laughs> Vim. Vim. Yeah. Uh, and and for scripting, yes, I would say Bash is my favorite one. Okay, that's cool. And and, and Pavel, I've I've, I've got to ask this, and I hope you don't take offense at it. Can you say must get moose and squirrel? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay, say, I guess I failed this. <laughs> just say, just say, must get moose and squirrel. Must get moose and squirrel. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> there are millions of people listening to the show now. They're going to be clapping asses up. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, you, you'll have to look up, look up uh, 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 Bullwinkle. Uh, was it uh, Rocky, Rocky? Rocky and Bullwinkle. Rocky and Bullwinkle. Just, just go to Wikipedia for Rocky and Bullwinkle, and you'll get the background for why I had you say that. Okay. okay. <laughs> 
<laughs> well, this has been a great show. It's been uh, Kirill and Pavel talking to us about Kriu. Um, thanks for being on the show, guys. Thank, Thank you. you. It was a pleasure. Very good, very good. Okay, that was them. And uh, uh, <laughs> I can't believe I did that. <laughs> Gareth, Gareth, what did you think while I recover here? <laughs> uh, I, I, I thought it was a, a really interesting project. Um, I, I think it'll be it'll be really interesting to see uh, what happens uh, with the projects like Creo um, and other ones that I'm sure people are thinking about, where uh, as as like Docker and, and containers and uh, start being more and more popular, and people start to think about, okay, I have all these containers on these servers, what if that server goes down? I don't want a single point of failure. I want to be able to easily migrate them with little downtime between host servers. Um, so it'd be really interesting to see uh, where Creo goes and, and what people start using it for. Yeah, and I'm looking at this from the perspective of, you know, we're hearing more and more about containers and containers and containers. It's kind of like the new thing, you know, Docker being the big thing. And I'm glad they're working with the Docker project to kind of, you know, help some of that migration stuff built get it more built into Docker and things. Uh, because the thing about containers, um, like like I said on the Docker show, uh, you know, my 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 client here, the one right in with the big green tree behind me here, uh, is uh, it requires me to run right now two Vagrant instances to be able to have like simulate the database on one side and simulate the web service on the other side. And it takes up a ton of memory. And it to launch it, it takes, you know, a good 30 to 40 seconds for each of those OSs to boot up. It's much faster to take Docker, which boots up in 30 or 40 seconds, but then the containers launch in like a second. And so it's, it's much better to have this. And now if we can migrate those containers from one place to another, and even if that's built into Docker, which would be really great if they get that all working out, uh, I, I think we're, it's going to be a game changer for the way we do VMs. You know, uh, they're running numerous instances of things up in uh, EC2 right now. And it would be nice if those were basically like core OS at the base and Docker above that. And then, uh, you know, lightweight apps because then they could do migration if they have load balancing issues, things like that. So I'm, I'm looking forward to this as well. So um, it's a great show. Uh, uh, I had a lot of fun. Um, and anything else before we go off to the closing of the show? No, I mean, the one final thing it was, is I was, I was really curious how you were going to have sneak that moose and squirrel bit in <laughs> by doing it literally <laughs> by doing it literally yeah it's probably the best way it's great it's good obviously being the host of the show i get to run a few crazy things speaking of being the host of the show we have a number of great shows on the docket already i have been diligently sending out email and you guys y'all the audience have been helping me out quite a bit by giving me new projects to go talk to but here's what we got on the upcoming docket next week we've got tygo.io which is an agile project management platform i actually started playing with this i think it's going to be really interesting almost a game changer as well um deviation tx which is a replacement firmware for the wakara devo series rc transmitters so basically rc planes being controlled by open source software uh copay uh, which is a uh, bitcoin management system that allows for a shared wallet. This should be really fascinating. Lucy, which is an open implementation of the CFML, the Cold Fusion Markup Language, I think that's what that's called. Uh, Weave, speaking of Docker, Weave is a Docker container-based deployment, so it basically orchestrates many Docker containers so they can all talk to each other without a lot of hard wiring. It's all managed it on the fly. Uh, just added to the schedule. I'm very happy for this. I only found out about this project last week, and I wrote them, and they said, yes, we want to be on the show. Uh, Veracrypt. Uh, some of you may know TrueCrypt and may even be using it today and worried about the fact that they stopped development on that a year ago. Veracrypt is the heir apparent. So they are taking over thanks to the value of open source. And so they're making changes. They're increasing the security. Awesome stuff. Um, so they're on the, just on the show. Also new to the list, I don't know how to pronounce this, Satnogs, Satnogs, S-A-T-N-O-G-S, which is a satellite ground stations real satellites in low Earth orbit. Uh, they've got tracking software using commodity hardware to be able to talk to the satellites. So now anybody can have a satellite. You can have a satellite, and you can have a satellite, and you can have a satellite. Uh, well, probably not. You have to launch it. It still gets up there. But anyway, you can run open source software and cheap hardware to be able to talk to that. Also, Dart, uh, uh, been on the schedule since last week. We've got the two creators of Dart. We, we had Dart on a few years ago, but there's been a lot of changes since then. We've got Lars Back and Casper Lund, the actual guys who are in charge of Dart, who are the head guys of Dart, are going to be coming on. Uh, we've got a number of other shows in the short list. To see our list, go to twit.tv slash floss. Um, and uh, there's a big spreadsheet listed, linked from there. If you have a project 
or you know of a project that you want to have on this show, this very show right here, uh, and it's not on that list, please have the project leader email me, Merlin at Stonehenge.com. That address is on the twit.tv slash flash page. Uh, you can contact me uh, via Twitter, Merlin, M-E-R-L-Y-N. I'm also on Google Plus frequently as Randall L. Schwartz. We have a live chat for this show. Uh, it's at, uh, right now it's 8.30 a.m. Pacific time. Oh, and I got to mention, starting about six weeks from now, we're moving earlier. The earliest show on the Twit Network is going to be even earlier. We're going to tape at 8 a.m. A.M. Pacific time uh, it means I got to wake up even earlier, and so does the people that run this show. Hi, John. I'm speaking of you. So it's going to be really early now. Um, and uh, uh, so you follow us at Floss Weekly on Twitter, and also Floss Weekly on Google Plus, where I announce all the new shows coming up. I am personally going to be in uh, Salt Lake City in early June for Yapsi, the yet another pro conference. I'm also going to be down in Porto Alegre, Brazil, speaking about Dart. Speaking about Dart, I'm going to be speaking about Dart down at Fizzle, 5,000 people open source conference. If you're in that area at all, please come by. It should be a really good show. That's all I'm going to plug. Uh, Gareth, what do you want to plug? Um, I really have nothing to plug. If anyone wants to follow me on Twitter, it's Gareth Greenaway. Um, I'm on Google Plus as well. I think Gareth J. Greenaway. So, yeah. Sounds good. Well, Gareth, thanks for joining me on today's show. You had some really good questions there for our guests. And uh, we'll look forward to seeing you again next week on Floss Weekly. Floss Weekly.